Good morning, Caribou Hill. It's a pleasure to join with you again to look at the Word of God and to see how it affects our lives. We're continuing to work through the book of James in a sermon series we've entitled Practical Christianity. And the reason we've done that is because in the book of James, he's really trying to take things from theoretical or theological and say, well, how does that actually live out in your day-to-day -day practical existence, your life, right? And so that's essentially what we're getting to. And the text that we're going to read, I'm going to read in a second, is uh, James chapter 2, starting at verse 14 and going to the end of the chapter, verse 26. And what's kind of important about this text is that it's probably one of the most controversial texts in the book of James and often the reason why some scholars, even people as um, famous as the reformer Martin Luther would kind of write James off or not really want to look at it. And it's because it comes down to this argument about um, faith and deeds or faith and action, faith and works. And so I'm going to read the text to you and then we'll kind of jump into it. All right. So James chapter 4, starting at verse 14. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith but do not have works? Can faith save you? If a brother or sister is naked and lacks daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, keep warm, and eat your fill, and yet you do not supply their bodily needs, what is good is that? So faith by itself, if it has no works, is dead. But someone will say, You have faith, and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I by my works will show you my faith. You believe that God is one, you do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. Do you want to be shown, you senseless person, that faith apart from works is barren? Was not our ancestor Abraham justified by works when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was active along with his works, and faith was brought to completion by the works. Thus the scripture was fulfilled and says, Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. Likewise, was not Rahab the prostitute also justified by works when she welcomed the messengers and sent them out by another road? For just as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is also dead. So if you grew up in the church, then you probably immediately see the tension that arises from this text. If you didn't grow up in the church, I'll try to explain it very briefly to you. What happened around the early 1500s to the middle of the 1600s was that there was this massive shift in Christian thinking. And it was based on a reading of scripture that began to understand that there was something happening within the religion of Christianity that wasn't um, actually authentic. And it came down to this, that people were being taught or told, mostly people who weren't able to read scripture for themselves, that they had to do works in order to be saved. In fact, there was even people who were saying you had to, to pay to buy your salvation by buying these things that they called indulgences. And this priest by the name of Martin Luther, as well as other scholars, were reading through scripture and dealing with this angst of never really feeling like, oh, have I done enough? Have I, have I given enough? Have I, right, this tension of this works um, deed faith. And what happened was, he came to an understanding through reading the writings of Paul, particularly the book of Romans, that you aren't saved by what you do, you can't win the favor of God, that you're saved because of what Christ did by dying on the cross for our sins. And so it is by putting your faith in him that you are saved, therefore you don't have to do works in order to receive your salvation, which is absolutely fundamentally true in what we believe. The, the tension for Luther and for other scholars since then, when they look at the book of James, is that James is clearly saying that you need to have deeds or actions within your faith. And so Martin Luther would even say, oh, he's pushing us back to a, to a works faith as opposed to just a salvific, grace-based faith, right? Just a trusting in Christ alone. And James is actually kind of dealing with this and arguing with it. I just think that he's looking at it from a different perspective. And so here's the tension. How am I saved 
by just trusting in Jesus Christ. We'll get into that as we look at the different things that James is pointing out. And at the same time, have a Christianity that is authentic, that is real, that is lived out, that is actually practical. Okay? And so, um, here's the rub. James is going to talk about, or I think we can see in the book of James, three different kinds of faith. Okay? There's devil faith, there's dead faith, or what James calls dead faith, and then there's authentic faith. The, the first type of faith that I want to pull from this text is devil faith, right? It's this understanding that you have, you know that there's a God. You know that there's a God, right? He says, even the demons know that there's a God, but it doesn't mean anything, right? So if you're like, oh, I believe that there's a God, and I have right theology, right? He gives an example of right theology, that there is one God. In a pagan world, which the believers were dispersed amongst, they believed that there was tons of gods, and, and you would worship one God, but you would believe in other gods, and you would give, pay homage to those gods in order to win their favor. James is like, no, this is a very important Judeo-Christian theology, that there's only one God, and he is over everything, and everything else is demonic. Okay, so he's saying that's a right theology. He says, who cares if you have that right theology? Because demons have right theology, but it doesn't mean anything. In fact, they oppose God, they want to destroy his works, and they want to bring down other believers. There's lots of people who know theology and use it as a way to trip up Christians so that they are question their faith and they actually stop wanting to follow God. Some of them are even professors in theological schools. And so just because you know theology doesn't mean that you're actually worshiping the true God. In the book of Mark, constantly, who are the people who acknowledge that Jesus is the Son of God? It's people who are demon-possessed. It's the demons inside of them saying, what would you do with the Son of God? Oh, don't hurt me, Son of God. Jesus, Son of the Most High God. Right, and Jesus is constantly saying, no, 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 shh, don't talk about who I am, because he doesn't want to be associated with the demonic. He doesn't want people to think that somehow he has a partnership with them. And so when we kind of play that out, having understanding of who God is, but actually opposing him, Jesus doesn't want anything to do with that. He's opposed to that kind of a thinking. People who believe, truly believe, that Jesus is who he says he is, and that they see the things in the world that they don't like, and they, they go, okay, well, we have to stand against that. For instance, um, the idea of people who are against abortion as Christians, I believe we should want to save every single life we possibly can, right? But then what happens is they go and they say, well, um, this person, this doctor is killing um, babies, therefore we should go and do violence against them and they kill them, right? How is that in any way a Christian response to something that you see is wrong? Or they go and they, they picket people at abortion clinics. Or even sometimes there was a, a movement that was going and picketing people outside of the funerals of war vets because they wanted to, to bring attention to this issue. Or they have really graphic examples of what abortion is that they advertise all over the place to try to shame people. None of that is a Christian expression. In fact, it's demonic because people look at Christians and say, oh, they just want us to believe their values and they're hurtful, hateful, mean, and rude, right? It's demonic. It disqualifies Christianity, even though it has right thinking and right theology. And so he's saying, no, 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 that's, that kind of stuff doesn't mean you're a Christian. It is actually kind of a demonic way of thinking. The second kind of faith that James talks about is, um, he says it's dead faith. Dead faith is this faith that has a complete and under theological standing. It actually believes all the stuff that we talked about in the introduction. It actually um, knows that Jesus Christ um, is God who came to earth through um, the Holy Spirit and a virgin, that he was born, that he lived this perfect sinless life, that he died on a cross, accused for things he did not do, but he did it specifically to die for the sins of the world, taking on our sin, and then he was placed in a grave and he rose again three days later, proving that he had the authority to defeat death 
and sin, and that he went up to heaven, and that everybody who believes in him, puts their faith in him, is saved from their sins, right? So all of that um, is this theology that is important. Not only that, that we believe that he gives us the Holy Spirit now in order to help us to overcome our sinful life, in order to be completely renewed, created into something completely different, so that we might truly have authentic relationship with God. And even though it's not fully here, we believe in faith that one day we will go to heaven and be with him and be completely set free from sin, temptation, death, and sickness. Right? So that's, that's theology. And that's essentially what Martin Luther and many people have said since, that that's what you need to be saved, that, that belief. And James isn't actually arguing against that. He isn't. What he's saying is that if you say you have faith, but it doesn't actually do anything to you, it doesn't actually change anything, then it's dead. It's not real. It's not alive. And so you might say that you have faith because you have right thinking, and maybe even you believe it in your heart, but it's not real if it doesn't actually change you, if it doesn't actually do something to you. One of the fundamental beliefs of Christianity is that we as humans are utterly, utterly depraved. That all of our good works, all of our good deeds, the best we could offer, are just filthy rags compared to what God has called us to in his holiness. And that all the good I could do couldn't ever erase all the bad that I've already done. And so what that means is, the only way that I could be saved is by God coming and paying the price and freely giving me this gift of salvation through this word, this understanding of grace, right? Undeserved, unmerited, um, just given. And when you receive it, you put your faith in that, then you are called his child, then you are redeemed, then you are given eternal life in that moment. The question isn't whether that is true. The question is, whether you truly believe it, right? He says it's dead. It's dead if it doesn't actually have meaning past your salvation. You weren't really saved. It isn't really um, something that is a part of you. There's this um, phrase either coined or at least popularized by um, Pastor Craig Rochelle of uh, Life Church. And he said that um, there's this thing that happens within Christianity that he calls practical atheism. So we believe, but we don't act in a way that is Christian. And so we believe, but it doesn't move us with great compassion, with a real desire to go and to serve God and to live our lives for his glory and for his kingdom. Craig has this sermon series, you should listen to it actually, where he is actually afraid for people because they think that they are saved because they have right theology, but because it isn't actually transforming them, it isn't actually something that's lived out in their lives, that they don't actually believe in, that they're literally atheists, that they're like, oh yeah, I believe all that, but I don't do any of the things that God called us to. You. In John chapter 14, verse 15, Jesus says, um, this is how I know that you love me, that you will follow my commands, commandments. See, to love Jesus is to do the things that he has called us to do. Specifically, he has called us to what um, we've already talked about as this, this royal rule, this great commandment to love God with everything and to love your neighbor as yourself. If we are not moved with great compassion and great love, if we are not following in obedience to God, then you might have good faith, but you're living as though you're an atheist. That's what James says is dead. Now the final thing he says is he says that there is an authentic faith. A faith that um, believes all of the good orthodox belief, but then says because of that, it motivates me, it moves me, it changes me. And actually, because we're completely depraved, 
that as I am saved from my sin and I'm given freedom from my depravity, that my motivation completely changes. I'm no longer motivated to try to prove to God that I'm good, but I'm motivated out of a love and out of a sincere gratitude for what God has done for me that I'm like, well, even now, everything I want to do, I want to do in order to glorify you, in order to love other people so that they might know the same grace that I know. In authentic, authentic faith, he gives three examples or three arguments to prove how you can know if your belief actually is being lived out and how faith needs deeds in order to be true. And so the first one he gives is the example of a, of a brother or a sister coming to you and in great need saying, oh, I don't have food, I don't have clothes, I don't know how I'm going to make it through tomorrow. And the believer would never say to them, um, oh, okay, well, let me pray for you. Go on. I hope that you somehow find food and somehow get warm. Especially when he's talking to a, to a mostly Jewish culture where hospitality is so important, where you, you always bring in the person and you make them feel like they're part of the family and the community. It's crucial, right? It would be easy to take this example, this argument, and make it um, into another point about us going and serving the poor. But that's not the point. This is an illustration he's given. And the actual thing that he's driving at is that it is so clear that it would be unloving and unkind to turn away somebody who has just said to you that they're desperate, that they've been vulnerable enough to come to you and say that they're desperate and in need of food and clothes and shelter, and for you to say, oh, well, that's too bad. Let me pray for you. I hope that something happens for you. Especially if you have food, if you have clothes, if you have a way to help them get shelter, right? He's saying everybody knows that that would be unloving. And he's not talking about some stranger on the street who you walk past and you feel compassion for them and you get them food or you try to hook them up with a local shelter. He's talking about a brother and a sister. He's talking about somebody you know, somebody you're intimate with, somebody who you love, somebody who's at a place of great and vulnerable need that you can step in and make a difference in their lives. Um, it's interesting, Deborah and I in quarantine have been watching the show Downton Abbey. And there's this scene where there is this maid who um, has kind of left and she's been disgraced. She got pregnant through somebody who had been staying at the house for a short time. And um, her life is in utter ruins. She loses her child and um, she ends up prostituting herself. And there's this um, mother-in-law who's living on the property who has great compassion for her, brings her into her house and everybody is scandalized by it, right? But she trains up the young girl, gives her a new trade, gets her out of prostitution and kind of sends her away, right? And so it's this beautiful example of seeing somebody and going, oh, that's too bad that your life is hard and you have to do something horrible, right? She says, no, 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 I have a way to not only um, give you hope, but to give you shelter, to give you food, to give you a trade so that you can go and start a new life and become somebody respectable and maybe have this one completely erased, this broken, depraved one gone. It's compassion and love. See, um, anybody who's a believer knows that if you can't do that, it's, it's not authentic, it's not true. The next one he, example he gives is Abraham, right? And, and Paul, in Romans, he talks about Abraham as being righteous through his faith, right? He, God tells him to go and do some. He trusts God, believes God, believes that he's hearing God, and therefore it's deemed him, his faith is deemed to him as righteousness. Well, James says, yeah, that's true, but the only reason we know that Abraham is actually faithful is because he does what God calls him to do. In fact, the thing that he, God calls him to do is so outrageous and crazy that most of us re would reject it, but Abraham doesn't. He goes and puts into action this thing that he God, God says to him. He goes and he's willing to take his son up to the mountain to lay him on an altar and to almost sacrifice him to God, even though J a Isaac has all the hope of his future. Abraham is like, no, 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 I trust that you're going to provide for me, even though I can't possibly see, it, see another way. And God stops him and says, oh yeah, now because you've done something, I know that you're actually faithful. I know that you're actually true, right? It's only because of Abraham's actions that we see that he actually has the faith to believe God. That's what James is saying. And the same is true 
of the third analogy, which is Rahab. Rahab looks and sees the God of Israel, and she knows that he is the God, that he is the true God. She doesn't have a relationship with him. She hasn't necessarily prayed to him. We don't know that. She just says, oh, no, this is true. I believe it. And so when she has opportunity, she goes and saves the servants of God, gets them out of the city safely so that they can go and do what they're supposed to do. And she says, I know that your God is going to win. So she shows her faith by being willing to put it into action. Here's the rub for us. Here's the thing that we have to think about. Does your belief in God actually change your day-to-day actions? And how can it? How can it? Do you actually spend time saying to God, God, what would you do to me? Listening, reading his word. Or do we say, oh, I have a good belief system, but it doesn't affect um, what I'm going to do. It doesn't ever transform me. It doesn't ever change me. I have uh, was praying the other day and going through my devotions, and I was just kind of struggling with some of my own stuff and some of my own discouragement. And God clearly said to me, he said to me, Bill, um, if you just lived out this one thing, if you just took out this one text, right, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be given onto you. He said, just do that for the next little while, right? So what that means is that scripture clearly says that I'm supposed to say, okay, I want God first and seek him before I allow myself to be distracted by work and email and media and entertainment or even my family, to seek him first and to even begin to go, okay, how do I seek him first in the way that I do those other things? How do I seek him first in the way that I love my wife? How do I seek him first in the way that I serve my children? Do I disciple my children in a way that says that the kingdom of God is paramount, it's the most important? How do I um, love this church by saying, oh yeah, yeah, God, this, see, it, it, it has, I have to be able to hear the word of God and say, okay, how does this transform my way of thinking, my, my actions? How does it transform? Yes, my care for the poor, but how does it transform my care for other people? How does it actually um, lived out in my life? And so that's my prayer for you, that we can take our faith and let it permeate into the very day-to-day way that we live so that um, when people look at us, they can see our good deeds and praise our Father in heaven. Let's pray. God, we love you. We thank you. We thank you because we are saved because of your sacrifice, Jesus. We thank you that you are the one who gives us life, hope, and freedom. And we pray even now, God, that you would continue to do that and to work that in our lives. As we read, as we do our devotions, God, reveal to us what it means to be transformed by you and to put into practice the things that you have said to us so that we might be able to live truly for you. Amen.